In this video, we're going to take a look at factor groups. Quick recap of a normal subgroup. So a subgroup is considered normal if AH is equal to HA for all A and G. And of course, that means the left cosets are equal to the right cosets. Now we showed that by showing that the two cosets were the same. We also used the normal subgroup test, which used conjugation, and that was saying that x, h, x inverse was a subset of h. And so if you'll recall, this is the work that we showed there. So what exactly is a factor group? Well, if we are dealing with h being a normal subgroup of g, then we have the set g mod h. So g mod h is essentially the set of all the cosets, left or right. And it is a group under the operation ah bh is equal to abh. So we'll see that look differently compared or based on whatever the actual operation is for that set, whether it's uh, additive or multiplicative. So the set of all cosets, the set of all AH for all A and G is either called a factor group or a quotient group. So obviously our textbook calls it a factor group, but you might also see it called a quotient group elsewhere. So let's talk about how we construct this. The, this first one is Z mod 3Z. So I've already listed out the elements of Z, which we know are just the integers. And 3z are just the integers that are multiples of 3. So if I'm going to construct z mod 3z, what's going to happen is I'm going to end up with cosets that will, again, partition the entire group. So obviously, I could have 3z. And 3z, as we know, negative 6, negative 3, 0, 3, 6 and so on in each direction. So on Z, that gets rid of all of the multiples of three. But what I want to do is partition the entire set Z. So now I might take one plus three Z. Well, one plus three Z would add one to each of these. So negative five, negative two, one, four, seven, so forth. So negative five, negative two, one, four, and so forth. I might also then add two to three Z. Well, that would add two to my original group, which is negative four, negative one, two, five, and so forth. And we can see exactly what's going to happen is we have now essentially used up all of the elements in Z. We've partitioned Z into three different cosets. So this Z mod 3Z is a group, a factor group or quotient group of 0 plus 3Z, of 1 plus 3Z, and of 2 plus 3Z. So essentially this group has three elements. The important thing to remember is that these three elements are now considered a group. And so we can see by looking at the group axioms, which I've rewritten for you here, that we have a group if closure, associativity, identity, and inverse properties are met. So we know that our group has the operation addition mod three. So if I take two elements of my group, essentially I'm going to be adding that first term. So for instance, one plus three Z plus two plus three Z is going to be three plus three Z, but mod three, that's zero. So zero plus three Z, which is just our group three Z. We didn't put a zero in front of it, but it's the same thing. And we can see by the table that it is closed. The associativity is going to be met uh, because addition mod three is associative. What is the identity? The identity is three Z or zero plus three Z. 
and the inverse. So each element has an inverse. Zero is its own inverse. Uh, one and two are each other's inverses. So one plus three z has an inverse of two plus three z because it results back in the identity. And then one plus three z has the has the two plus three z inverse because it results back in the identity. Uh, what's also interesting to note is that this group is isomorphic to z3. So again, you'll see a lot of talk about isomorphisms in this section. Here's one more practice before we talk about anything else, just to make sure we are understanding what's happening. Um, if you're still feeling a little bit unsure, then work through this example with me, otherwise press pause and try that on your own. So we're trying to find the elements of U32 mod U16 of 32. And so good first step would be list all of the elements in each of those groups. So U32 is anything less than 32 relatively prime to 32. And so we're going to list those here probably as quickly as I can, just so that we don't make a 39 minute video. And then my other group is based on those elements. So U16, 32 means I'm looking for any elements in U32 that would result in one mod 16. So that's going to be pretty easy. That's going to give me one. And then all of the rest of these up to here obviously are not going to be candidates because that would be three and five and seven and so forth. But again, if I'm looking for one mod 16, then that's just going to be then 17 because 17 would be congruent to one mod 16. And again, the rest of these would not work. So that was pretty straightforward to find those elements. Okay, so U16 of 32 gives me 117. So now we're looking at the elements of U32 mod U16 of 32. So we're going to have, this is H. So we would have H which would be 117. So I'm going to cross off 1 and 17. And then what if I had, now notice that this um, operation is not addition. This operation is multiplication. So what if I had not 2H, because that would give me 2 and, you know, 34, which would be two again. But what if I had three H? Well, three H would give me three. And then three times 17 is 51, but mod 32 is 19. And then I would have not four H because again, we don't have any even values. So now I would take five H. So that would give me five and 21. And we can see exactly what's happening here. So 7H is going to give me 7 and 23. And then we would have 9H, which is 9 and 25. And then we would have 11H, which would be 11 and 27. And then 13H, which would be 13 and 29. And then 15H, which would be 15 and 31. And if you'll notice, I didn't continue crossing things off, but I could have 7 and 23, 9 and 25, 11 and 27, 13 and 29, and 15 and 31. So you can see I have partitioned the set. And so if I were to list the elements, I could just list them as H, 3H, 5H, and so on. Using that same example, let's take a look now because we know that that factor group has an order of eight, which we could have determined because again, there are eight elements. 
or because there were 16 elements in U32 and two elements in U16 of 32. So again, we have eight elements, which means it has to be isomorphic to Z8, the external direct product of Z4, Z2, or Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2. So the question is, which is it and how do we know? Well, this is going to kind of put together a lot of things that we learned starting way back in chapter four when we talked about cyclic groups. Now, first of all, we should know that Z8 is cyclic, whereas Z4, the external direct product of Z4, Z2, and Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2 are not because four and two and two and two and two are not relatively prime. We should also note that any element in Z2 cross Z2 cross Z2 is going to be of order two. So how do I know that? Well, let's think about Z2. Any element in this external direct product is going to look something like this made up of zeros and ones. And the operation would be just addition. So let's say I added this element to itself or squared it, which would be make, basically taking it times two. That would give me two, zero, two, but again, this is mod two. So that would give me zero, 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 which is the identity. Every element is going to behave that way and we're going to have an order of two. So why am I talking about orders? Because that's how we're going to determine which group this is isomorphic to. So let's take a look at when we're talking about the orders of the element. This element, H or 1H, um, in our example is 117, and that is considered the identity. So we're asking how many times do I have to take that uh, times itself to get back to the identity? So again, keeping in mind that even though the um, group operation for any of these are going to be addition, our group operation in U32 is multiplication. So when I ask for the order of 3H, essentially I know that 3H is 319, but 3H squared would be taking the 3 and squaring it to get 9 and taking the 19 and squaring it. Um, and again, this is mod 32, and so I'm going to end up with 25. So the order of 3H is not 2. Well, we already know then that it cannot be isomorphic to that last group because every element has an order 2, and our orders need to match up for them to be isomorphic. So if we continue, we actually determine that if I take 3h to the fourth power, then I end up back at h. So that means element 3h has order four. So let's now check another element, say 5h. 5h, I'm not five, let's do seven. 7h is 7, 23. So now if I look at 7h squared, that's 7 squared, which is 49, but mod 32 gives me 17. And then 23 squared is going to give me 1, again, mod 32. And so this element has order 2. Now, if I do the same thing with 9h, 9 and 25, I actually end up back at H as well. And so what happens now is I know that both of these elements have order two. So does that help me at all? Well, it sure does. Because Z8 is cyclic, we have a theorem that says if D is a positive divisor of N, then the number of elements of order D in N is phi of D. And that's only for cyclic groups. So if I think about um, Z8 and using 2. So phi of 2 is the same of, as U2, if you'll remember that. And U2 would just be the element of 1. So what this tells me is in Z8, there has to be only one element of order 2. Well, I've just proved that there are two elements of order 2 
in my group, which means it cannot be isomorphic to Z8, and therefore by process of elimination, we have Z4 cross Z2. Let's finish out this video with just one property, that is Cauchy's theorem for abelian groups. This theorem says let G be a finite group and P be a prime that divides the order of G, then G has an element of order P. So you might be thinking that you've heard this before. Well, Lagrange's theorem says that if H is a subgroup, the order of H divides the order of G. Notice for Cauchy's theorem, this is not saying that H has to have a subgroup of that order. So this is just saying, hey, if there's some prime number that divides the order of the group, then there has to be an element of that order. So for instance, if I have to prove that an abelian group of order 33 is cyclic, I can do so pretty easily using Cauchy's theorem. So I can say that based on Cauchy's theorem, that there has to be some element A in G such that the order of A is 3, because 3 is a prime number that divides 33. And there has to be some other element, we'll call it B, such that the order of that element is 11, because again, 11 is of prime order and divides 33. So based on that, then there's some element AB, where the order is obviously the least common multiple of the orders of each of those groups, which means the order of element AB is 33. Well, 33 therefore generates the entire group and therefore group G must be cyclic. Up next, we're going to finish up chapter nine by taking a look at internal direct products.